part of the reason why I got into herbalism because I was like, I want to be available to my immediate community and empowering them. Because I think that's how we make big sustainable changes is in the small local steps around us. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer, a slow living apparel and lifestyle brand. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having constantly in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm. One that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. Come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Since we're talking a lot about spring these days, what's a plant that you are drawn to? I've been really drawn to lately bachelor buttons and straw flower. I just think that they're so pretty and I love how when they're growing, they look like they're dried. And when you cut them, obviously they're still dried and then they just stay pretty for so long. I really love them. Have you got your seed? Yes, I got some bachelor button seed in a pollinator pack that I got from Southern Exposure Seeds. They arrived a few days ago, and I'm so excited to plant them. Always good to plant pollinators, no matter what you're going to do with them. It's a gift to the earth just by putting them in. And we're talking a lot about plants today in this episode with Farai Harold. She's a writer and herbalist, among other things who has a special relationship with plants and a lot to teach us about creating a partnership with our surrounding plant allies. Mom, what plant is speaking to you these days? Well, I'm really focused on strawberries right now. Back in the fall, I got the idea to use strawberries as a ground cover from our friends, Nikki and Dave Schauder from Permaculture Gardens. Some of you listeners might remember them from episode 11. And ever since then, I've been excited about planting a whole bunch of them, not only to have them to eat, but as a way to control weeds in my planting beds. Nikki and Dave are a wealth of information. Which is why everyone listening definitely wants to hear about the intensive Grow Your Own Food workshop that we have coming up with Nikki and Dave on March 13th. We're really excited about this intensive. It also comes with when you register, you're going to get your own printable workbook that Nikki and our team have been working really hard on. And you will get a planting calendar. And if you sign up early enough, so by March 6th, you will get a customized planting calendar for your zip code. So Nikki will actually be going in and adjusting everyone's calendars for them personally for the class, which is super cool. If you're a member of the Almanac, you get 50% off this workshop, which is amazing. And you can find that code in the membership benefits section of the portal. You know where to find it. And yeah, if you're just joining us, there is also a way to join the Almanac pre-enrollment. Right now, the Almanac's technically closed. But if you really want to take this workshop and become a member of the Almanac for a year, we are totally into that. And we'll give you that 50% discount code too. So no fear. Just go to the landing page, ladyfarmer.com, and click events and then intensive, and you'll find all the information there. Sorry, that was a big tangent, but needed to get through all of that. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm understanding something clearly. If you sign up by March 6th, your planting calendar is customized for your very own zip code? Yes. Wow. Yes. But everyone who signs up gets a planting calendar. Right. But if you sign up early enough, then we can promise this customized planting calendar. Yes. That's pretty cool because as you gardeners out there know, these zones are really big and, you know, something might be zone seven or whatever, but 
you could still be hundreds of miles from there and the elevation all different or whatever. And so by zeroing in on your zip code, you really get some specific information about when to plant a seed and when to harvest it and the kind of ground it likes and so much specific information. So it's really a bonus. It's really cool. And also, we're excited because this is our first intensive workshop, meaning that it's great for experienced gardeners as well as beginners, because we'll be going more in depth with the information, and you'll be able to take this customized planting calendar and apply it to any and all plants that you want to grow for yourself this year or any other year. Yeah, and definitely after hearing today's conversation with Farai, We're sure that you will be itching to get out there and start cultivating your own plant allies. So without further ado, we will hand it over to Farai. I am currently living in Kansas with my little family, my partner, Anthony, and my daughter and our rambunctious dogs who may interrupt everything. (laughs) My father is from here, originally born and raised, and he moved to Zimbabwe several decades ago. He met my mother there. My mother is Zimbabwean, born and raised, and that's where I was born. That's where I grew up. 18, my dad was like, you're going to college in America. And I was like, okay. And I had never been here before, didn't know anything, hadn't met anyone I I only had a half brother that I knew a little bit yeah I moved to America and settled down here and I've been here for the past oh my goodness 12 years that's a little bit of my story and my origin story but it definitely informs you know everything about me how I got into the things that I'm into now my dad was very much an animist an archer he really believed in minimalism and slow living even before I knew that that was a thing I was just like uh daddy's weird he used to hunt with a bow and arrow and he made the bows and arrows himself so he would like find a tree and watch the tree and then harvest the tree and then make the bow and arrow and he made bows and arrows for all of us and his friends he forged the metal himself and so he was very much connected to earth And I think he was like my first example of so living and being in connection and community with the earth. But growing up as a child, I didn't think at all like what that meant, right? I I do so much now that I wish that I had paid more attention. I just thought it kind of sucked that I had to go out into the bush every weekend with dad when I could be at home reading Little House on the Prairie or outside playing. Yeah, that's kind of like my story. My dad is a big piece of my lineage. I'm an herbalist and I have kind of medicine people on both sides of my family, the settler white side and then the Zimbabwean Mm -hmm. medicine men, medicine woman side too. So that's been something that I've been working on with myself for about eight years now. And then I'm also a writer. So you like grew up in Zimbabwe. The political unrest in Zimbabwe kind of kicked into hard drive when I was about four. And we moved from Zimbabwe to the neighboring country of Botswana. And so that's where I grew up. In my head, I operate in all three of those countries as like where I'm from. Yeah. The way you just described it sounded like you would have these experiences with your dad on the weekend. But generally, your life to you felt pretty like normal kid reading. Oh, yeah. Very suburban. I mean, I went to private schools. I mean, we weren't rich. We were super middle class, lower middle class, I would say. But I had a pretty typical childhood, you know, going to the mall, watching music videos, you know, (laughs) all the same stuff, except it was an African influence. So everyone looked like me. I didn't really experience kind of the segregation and racism and stuff until I had moved here. And when your dad said, okay, you're going to college, In America, were you like into that? Were you not into that? (laughs) I don't think I had an opinion. (laughs) I was mostly terrified. I didn't know what to expect. Also, because my dad was so out of touch with everything, he was very much, oh, college is going to be $20 a credit hour. He was so, (laughs) 
I mean, he hadn't been in America for over 30 years. So he was very <laughs> not up to speed with how things were. He was like, you can get a job washing dishes and rent a room. <laughs> I think I didn't know what to expect. I definitely knew that I didn't want to stay in America. I definitely knew that I wanted to come home as soon as possible. So I was just like, in my head, I'm just going to get my education. And then I'm going to go right back home to, you know, my boyfriend and everything else that I had going on. <laughs> I went to college in the 70s. And, and it was it was like that, like, you know, a couple thousand dollars for the whole year. And people work their way through waiting tables and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can imagine. I can see how your dad was if he had been out of the country for a while. That's interesting. So where did you end up going? I looked at KU and it was entirely way too big. Even though I grew up in the capital city of Botswana, I went to a local university, a much smaller public one in Topeka, Kansas called Washburn. It's very small. Like you can walk around campus. It's that tiny. And so it definitely met all my needs in terms of not being overwhelming. Like when I first arrived, JFK, the airport, was the most people that I had ever seen in my life. So I was incredibly overwhelmed. And you were 18. So you were like an adult, basically. Wow. Didn't know anyone, didn't know anything. You sort of had this nature connection and this elder wisdom on both sides of your mom and dad. But how did you get into the plant thing? And tell us the story of the garden that you have today, how you got there. I did not study plants in school at first I thought that I was going to be a nurse and a nurse practitioner because everyone was all oh you're so caring you should just you know be a nurse and I was like okay Uh, (laughs) so I enrolled in nursing school and I was like I've watched Grey's Anatomy this will be fine (laughs) no it was not fine about a year into my studies, even though I was enjoying it very, very much, the kind of clinical aspect of it, the applying, the learning, the systems of the body, even though that all fascinated me, it was, I think the bureaucracy of kind of the medicine world was too much for me. And I took an intro to women's and gender studies class as an elective, and it kind of shattered my world. And I was like, oh, you mean I can have an opinion about like my life? I can do things because I want to do them. And I was like, wow. So I dropped out of college and just kind of did all the things that I wanted to do. I I went into a play. I stopped waiting tables and got a job working with mental health. I did all these things. And then finally, when I felt like I had an idea of what I was like and what I liked, I went back to school for writing and public relations because I was just really good at that. And so finished that off. And all my herbal stuff kind of leads back to my hair. I had relaxed hair, so chemically straightened hair my whole life. My stepmother straightened my hair. And then when I moved here, I didn't have access to all those things. And I lived in rural Kansas and my wife family didn't know how to do my hair and I didn't know how to do my hair. And so we cut off all the straight hair and let my curly hair start growing. And I was just using conventional products from the store. I was like 19, 20 and didn't yet know about toxins and parabens and things like that in the body products in America. And so I started doing research. I was like, why aren't these things working for my hair? Why is my scalp feeling like this? And that just kind of snowballed for me, kind of practicing clean living I was like, well, if I can use rosemary in my hair, then what about if I use it for this and this? And what does this plant do? And then I was like, oh, my God, I love everything about this. And then that has just progressively snowballed. I, you know, studied under one of my teachers, Okoe. She's 81 and she's been practicing herbalism for like 40 years. And I was one of her apprentices a couple of years ago you know, taking lots of courses, doing all kinds of stuff, teaching locally. So yeah, it's been a long process, but it really started with my hair and clean beauty, I guess. You said you were like 19. So that was kind of all intertwined in your college experience and after college. And And then as for my garden, I think my garden is about four years old now. I started off as most people start off with container gardens 
and then moved from container gardens to raised bed gardens. We built the ugliest look in raised bed gardens out of concrete blocks. Me and my partner, we did those and they were so successful. We had lots of produce that first year and I was hooked and in love. And then that second year of gardening is when I began my apprenticeship with a Koei. And so I really neglected my garden because I was in her garden every week and working in her garden. She has a giant, giant, giant medicinal herb garden. And so I didn't really have the energy to dedicate to mine. So all I did was transplant the excess that Okoe had in her garden into mine. And so my garden is mostly medicinal herbs now at this point. We expanded it last year to try and grow more food, but we didn't do it till too late on in the season. So I didn't have as big of a food harvest as we usually do. But I have bountiful medicinal herbs growing all the time all over in my backyard. So that's about what my garden is. I would really love to grow more flowers and more food this year. Yeah, same with me. My my herbs and things sort of crowded out my food this year, which is why I'm in a CSA. I couldn't count on my own bounty. <laughs> but boy, did I have a lot of Tulsi. <laughs> What are you really drawn to in your garden in terms of the plants and how do you use them? I mean, I think I mean, from my own experience, there's certain things I gravitate to and like I just take special delight in, even though you might have a whole bunch of different things. What, what are those things for you? So I really love the folklore and the story of plants. I don't think and the ways in which human beings have interacted with them or even how these plants came to be in my garden, you know. There's some plants like my yarrow came from my friend Carrie, and I believe she found it on the side of a highway in Colorado. Now it's flourishing in my garden, and I've given yarrow babies to people, and it's flourished in theirs. Oh man, I really love nettle. I transplanted marshmallow that I'm really interested in seeing it bloom and, and grow and blossom. I don't, I love all of them. I love mugwort. My mugwort was like a tiny little fingerling that I pulled out of my friend Jessica's farm. It's three times as tall as me sometimes. It's so big. And it came from this tiny little baby. And so I definitely get a kick out of that. And also mugwort is just rich in folklore and history and magic with human beings. I love all of them. (laughs) Talk to us about mugwort. Mugwort is taking over certain areas of my garden, almost where I'm having to take some of of it out. And I feel kind of bad about that, but it's it's just totally taking over. Mine does the same thing. And it's one of those plants where I know that it has a lesson to teach me, but I'm not yet ready for it. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had those, like something that you're like, I know that I'm going to have a deep relationship with you at some point, but I'm not there yet. And that's pretty much where I'm at with mugwort. I love the folklore. It's definitely a plant that's associated with dreaming and lucid dreaming and memory of dreams. But it's just like a pretty prolific plant. It's also something that you can use for culinary. It's a bitter. People use it to season food, to season poultry and things like that. But I haven't deepened my relationship with it. I have just enjoyed watching it. I definitely cut it down a lot each year. And then I take my cuttings and I dry them and I burn them and I weave with them. But I'm just physically getting to know the plant and I haven't done any spiritual work with it yet or deep work with it yet or even learned too much about it yet because I'm focusing on other things in my garden and making medicine with other things in my garden right now. You mentioned nettle. We just attended this program yesterday where they showed us how you can use nettle as a fiber. And Mm -hmm. actually somebody demonstrated how to, to red it, to get the fine fibers out. And she was making lace. I have a very deep, love of now. I think on my Patreon, it was one of the first plants that I ever talked about. There's fairy tales in which nettle exists and is used and is woven and things like that. 
And I want to one day have nettle fiber that maybe I can knit into something. But I have, yeah, a nettle washcloth that I scrub my body with every time I take a shower. And I just love it so much. You were speaking a moment ago about when the plants show up, you know, maybe they have something to show you or play a role in your life. And I have a couple examples of that. And I think I even messaged you last year about this. You had posted on Instagram that you love Mullen. And I had so much of it last year. Again, another example where the medicinal herbs and stuff take over the food, but there was so much mullein. I mean, it was just like absolutely everywhere. And I wanted to give it away. I wanted to say, look, I need to share this because it's such a great plant. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out that it is an aid in for breathing problems. Oh yeah, respiratory ally for sure. And what an amazing phenomenon a year when you know the whole COVID thing was was breaking loose and people were having trouble breathing. I had a plant in my garden show up last year that I had never seen in my neighborhood. I knew exactly what the plant was because I was always pointing it out to people like look there's Bidens you have Bidens. I walk around my neighborhood a lot with my daughter and had never seen it anywhere near us and so Bidens showed up in my garden prolifically I mean it was in the pathways it was in the garden beds and it was kind of wrecking everything and one of the ways in which I was taught by one of my teachers is that when something shows up for you like that you need to pay attention to it I was just so caught up in the hustle and bustle of life I weeded the Bidens and I was like man I really need to make medicine with this plant it's here let me do this and I didn't prioritize it and I missed the window for harvesting Bidens to make medicine. And right when I missed the window, I fell sick. I had a really, really bad infection in my jaw that required me to be on like two or three rounds of antibiotics. And you know what the perfect medicine for infections is? Bidens. I was... I took the two rounds of antibiotics and they still didn't touch the infection. And so finally I found this remedy by this company called Kick-Ass and they make this product called Kick-Ass Biotic that had Bidens in it. And I took that and that finally kicked the infection because it was like all up my jaw into my ear. Yeah, I was calling it my medieval infection. (laughs) It was a really good lesson for me is that, you know, the plants, they're looking out for us. I should have just gotten down and grabbed some Bidens and done something with it. But I was just not being as intentional with my time and my space. I mean, it was a pandemic. It's 2020, right? This spring, I'm so excited for chickweed and purslane and dandelion and all the spring allies that show up on this side of the world in the spring and to actually not let the season to be in community with these plants pass me by. It's big. You have this thing and you don't know much about it, but you know, I think even in the beginning to recognize maybe this has something to tell me is a first step and it might take us a couple of seasons. I have a similar story. I I started out with a a potted Tulsi plant that was about three inches high. And before I knew it in the next season, my whole garden was just covered, covered with it. And I didn't know what in the world that meant or why it was proliferating so much. And it's been that way for two or three years. And then finally, last summer, a friend of mine was over and something fun to do, made a tincture out of it. Mm -hmm. And I discovered a couple months later that this Tulsi tincture Mm -hmm. was the one ingredient that was really helping me control my blood sugar. And it had been coming to me for like three years saying, Hello, just like you said about the Biden, I'm here. I'm here in a really big way. I'm going to cover your entire yard. So I just, gosh, that really shifted something in me. That's like, gosh, that that was really being my friend. It really solved a thing for me that I had been sort of grappling with. And I've been trying all kinds of herbs and herbal mixtures. and, And I was able to identify that that was the ingredient that was making the difference. So it's so cool. And by the way, we're not offering medical advice on this. Yeah. podcast, do, you know, go to your doctor, do all that kind of stuff. We are not doctors just making that clear. This is my own personal experience. So disclaimer, I just love that that plant was called Biden. <laughs> oh, snap. I just only now made that connection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's also known as like Spanish needle. It's a pretty, it's a common weed 
and you were speaking yeah. about Mullen, but in 2019 yeah. was the year of seeing Mullen everywhere I went, every trail that I hiked, every obscure side road that I took, it was just Mullen, 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 Mullen. That was the fall of 2019. And then January 2020 is when my family, I'm pretty sure we had COVID, but no one knew what COVID was. That was the thing that I used for my daughter for her cough, for me for my cough, for my partner. I mean, in conjunction with actually seeing our functional medicine practitioner and, you know, other things. But Mullen was a cough remedy, lung remedy ally, you know, and I was very grateful that I had come across it in 2019. So, wow. Awesome. We want to chat a little bit about sustainability. It's definitely a buzzword that's thrown around a lot, particularly these days. We want to hear about what sustainability, what that term means to you, both personally and around food, lifestyle, and your work. Many layers of that word. I think the first thing that comes to me around sustainability is community, right? I try to do everything as small and as local as possible. So when I can in the season, I'm getting my vegetables and my seedlings and my starts from small local farmers. I'm getting my CSA from a farmer that I know. I'm getting my meat from my farmer friend that I know that I've developed a relationship with. So to me, that's way more sustainable than sourcing things from far away places. I had this conversation with someone who they kind of got onto me because I had shared a picture of this traditional liver dish that I had cooked on my social media and they were like oh I want to like this but I can't and this is a like a near and dear person to me so if they see this like I love you no beef I'm just giving this as an example but I actually know exactly where this is coming from you know this is within 30 minutes of me and this is a sacred meal to me this is sustainable whereas if I'm making lentils that were grown probably in like India or something like that and then harvested by someone for really cheap labor and then shipped or flown you know hundreds of miles to me and I'm not saying I'm not perfect I mean I eat rice this rice isn't grown in America you know so I'm just saying that in everything that I do I try to think about the smallest footprint that I can have in getting this thing into my life. And that informs everything that I do. It's part of the reason why I got into herbalism because I was like, I want to be available to my immediate community and empowering them. Because I think that's how we make big sustainable changes is in the small local steps around us. And then that informs everything else. And if you hold people accountable and if you're in community with people we then take each other's health and the planet's health and we're more invested in these things if we're nourished you know we're in community with each other so i heard something yesterday that speaks very well to this and i don't know where the phrase comes from i heard instead of seeking 15 minutes of fame in your life seek 15 miles of fame Isn't that great? And that speaks about community. And I think about our community, you know, our CSA says and the people that do the meet and whatever, they are famous around here. They are, they do have, you know, the the providers. I'm obsessed with all of the people that grow our food and raise animals. They're my celebrities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When one of my CSA farmers, there was one year they had to discontinue their CSA because Kansas legislation was making it really hard for them to have health insurance. And so the farmer had to get a job and I bawled like it was me losing my health insurance. I was (laughs) post office workers and sanitation workers and park rangers and farmers. Those are my celebrities. Those are my people. We had the same experience with our very local CSA, like practically next door to us. We could walk there. For various reasons, they stopped doing it. And I was the same way. I felt bereft. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I found another great one and it, you know, but I have to drive and it's kind of a drive, but that's okay. There's, they're rock stars too, man. They're total rock stars. And I feel privileged to have anybody that can provide my food from a farm. Exactly. And, uh, it's been an eventful year. Can you talk to us about how the events of 2020 have affected you and your work and your life in general? And what is it that you'd like to bring forward from this crazy time into this new era, wherever that's going to be? 2020 was a wild ride for sure. I had maybe 4,000 followers on Instagram towards the beginning of 2020. And I was perfectly content, happy as a clam, doing what I do, kind of sharing about herbalism and sustainability and like my everyday little Waldorfy mommy life. And when the George Floyd murder happened and people started kind of sharing more content from people of color, my name among, you know, Black herbalists kind of blew up. I went from 4,000 followers to I'm now at like 22,000, which for someone like me (laughs) who had no intention of any of this, it was a big change, right? I was developing my Patreon for my small following because that is what was the the need that they had expressed that they would like. And so I was naturally doing it for them. I thought I was going to have four patrons and I was just going to have fun creating content. And then within a period of a week, I had gone from 4,000 followers to 19,000 followers and it just kept, you know, getting bigger and bigger. And so that was, I think a big change for me was that, oh, I can do good with this exposure, even though it's, I had some unsavory experiences as well. But I was like, oh, I can do good with this. And so I was able, gave away like 22 scholarships to my Patreon for Black and other BIPOC people to have, you know, access to my Patreon for free for a year. So I think that was the biggest thing for me was being able to start putting myself out there more and then putting it in the hands of the people that I wanted to have it. And then all the support from everyone else was just so incredible. I did not know that people would resonate with me in the way that they did. And I was very surprised and very grateful because I am rather goofy and blunt. And so (laughs) I think that was the biggest change was the exponential growth of my online presence. And then my partner got deployed, which was not at all something that we saw coming. And so I kind of got thrown into solo parenting, which is very hard, especially in the middle of a pandemic. I have an incredible support system, but, you know, trying to navigate a new business while alone, while doing all this stuff was really big and really scary. And then also while being Black in America, oh my God. That was just terrifying in and of itself. I have family members who are white supremacists. And so kind of holding space for all of those big feelings of fear, but also happiness, but also deep anxiety. So I think one of the biggest things that I learned from 2020 was that, well, number one, it's okay to not be okay. I really learned how to take moments for myself. It kind of almost felt a little bit selfish to be like, you know, I'm going to take a bath at 9 a.m. But this is what I need right now. I need to be dipped in salts and herbs to feel better. And so that's what I'm doing. And so definitely taking multiple moments for myself throughout the day, doing a lot more foot soaks, eating a lot more nourishing foods, definitely prioritizing self-care. One thing that I prioritized was waking up in the morning and making sure that I looked good and felt good. And that almost seemed like a little bit frivolous at first, but I was like, no, you know, everything else is going wrong. At least I have this. There was a period right when my Patreon started where my fridge broke, my dishwasher broke, my washing machine broke, and my toilet broke. And I was alone. My partner was gone. And so I just like had all these appliances breaking 
in the middle of the pandemic trying to figure everything out and so I was like you know what I'm gonna put mascara on today (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh I I was basically a zombie when I would call the plumber and they would be telling me it's three hundred dollars for something that they had just supposedly fixed a week ago I'm in the garden like holding on to my mugwort plant everything will be fine (laughs) (laughs) oh my god That's a really wonderful segue, I think, into the next thing we wanted to ask you about was currently we have in our online community, the Almanac, we are designing the focus this season around rest, like capital R rest, and what it really means to to rest and to take time and, you know, self-care and time for yourself. All these things are like such thrown around things that we may or may not actually be able to do well but I would love to get your thoughts on rest and like what real rest means and what that is to you you know I paid attention to the word rest right when winter began because winter is the season of rest and what that looked like for me and I think the biggest thing for me specifically as an herbalist and in watching people and how they interact with the world is true rest nourishing rest begins with the quality of sleep you're getting and so I kind of outside of the occasional time I only had like three hours of sleep the other day because I finally broke down and watched Bridgerton because everyone was talking about it but for the most part I take my sleep very seriously that's the beginning of it I mean and then you can do other things like one way that I focus on rest is if there's this one activity that I need to do and especially if it's a meditative activity I'm going to really try and put all my focus into it because then I find that is nourishing and almost restful for me whether it is making a tea for my child or preparing a meal or getting ready for bed. It's like being mindful about this one activity almost sets you in a restful mood. But I think actually prioritizing true rest where we don't have our phones on us when we get into bed. We don't have our computers next to us. We're trying to get six to eight hours of deep sleep. Our ancestors prioritized rest. Sleep was holy and necessary and I was listening to something the other day, and I've heard this multiple times before about how in certain traditions, how the day began at nightfall when they went to bed because the quality of sleep that they got determined what their day was going to be like. Is there a certain herb that you like to use to help you sleep well? I mean, I know there are a lot of things that fall into that category, but do you have one? There's so many, and it just depends on what ailment or what complaint that you have about sleep. Yeah. Right. And blessedly, I have ADHD. So when it's time for bed, I'm out. And so if I'm having anxious thoughts, I think anxiety may be the only thing that stops me from sleeping. And that's very rare. And vetiver doesn't make everyone else sleepy, but definitely knocks me out. But a lot of people will gravitate towards things like passion fruit or chamomile or rose, lavender, the adaptogens like Tulsi and all that other stuff, those will help soothe you. And and then sometimes it is staying away from electronics at least an hour before bed. That might allow your circadian rhythms to slow down enough and calm down enough and use the blue blocking glasses if you need to use those if you have to be on electronics before bed. Yeah, we talk a lot about the light and we sell this product called the bedtime bulb that I use beside my bed that it's like it's it's a warm light and like just sort of tells your body it's time to go to sleep and all that yeah there's so many factors and like you know so many causes of of bad sleep but well here's a question where I always like to ask our guests can you speak to the term good dirt and what that might mean to you it can be literally or metaphorically or just any way you want to answer that the first thing that came to mind was good conversation but I think the soil, the dirt is the beginning of all life. Like good dirt is filled with mycelium and microbes and seeds and plants and bones and water and minerals. And good dirt is like the foundation of a good garden. And gardens bring so much joy and food and life and light to people's lives. So, and talking about good dirt is good dirt. So that's the correct answer. Yes. (laughs) 
Well, what is it that you would most like our listeners to know about you and the work that you would do here? Oh my goodness. (laughs) Well, definitely, I think this theme has actually been coming up so much for me is this quote by Dr. Terry Trent. I'm going to botch this quote, Uh, but it's essentially that all the dreams that you have, if they are for the betterment of your community, then, you know, they're going to be good for everyone involved. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think that's the foundation of what I'm trying to do with my life, you know, for the betterment of myself and for the betterment of my immediate community. If people are attracted to my work or my writing or want to work with me, then just knowing that I'm truly community oriented. And that's what informs what I do. Because I am so supported and nourished by my immediate community and friends. And I'm also a doula. And I feel like we need that. And as someone who grew up in Africa, in Zimbabwe specifically, and in the intense culture that I grew up around and grew up in, I know and I've seen what nourishing community does. And I just really want that for all of us. And it's a way that I feel like human beings lived at one point in time. And when I moved here, I was really struck with how the first thing, like after a year of being in America, someone was like, what is America like to you? What are people like there? And the first thought that I had was individualistic. I grew up knowing that my actions affect myself and everyone around me. Every auntie is your auntie. Every mom in the store sees you cutting up, you know, she's got your mom's back. You know, that's what I grew up experiencing. And so I kind of want that back again, the village for everyone, because it's, I know what it's like. I've built that with my friends and my family of just feeling so nourished and supported and held. And I really just want that for everyone, you know? And maybe that's one thing people can know about me is that I'm community obsessed, maybe. (laughs) That's beautiful. I love that too. I've experienced that in certain places in my life, but it's definitely not an American. It's not a a global culture. Yeah. There's something really special about it though. So in that vein, you know, now we've got all these online communities, especially in COVID times, physical community is one thing, but Mm -hmm. this year has not been the year for that. Mm -hmm. And now... (laughs) you know, we're experiencing other kinds of community and of course it's not the same, but don't you think we can find some of the same support and sharing? And I 1000% agree. So I used to work for a DV agency, domestic violence. So I took my daughter to work with me after she was born for the first six months and infinite work policy expired. And so I became a stay at home parent with her. And I lost the physical community, right, of having all my coworkers around me, you know, with me all the time, with my child all the time, and I was at home. And so it was my online community that sustained me. All the breastfeeding mom support groups, all the attachment parenting support groups, all the baby wearing support groups where we were just in community with each other, messaging back and forth, asking questions, getting education, and just holding space for each other. Those groups were so nourishing to me up until I was able to, you know, build a physical community. But I still hold those places in high esteem and high regard and recommend them to anyone because I think that they're life-changing and they're life-saving and they make people feel less alone, which is, you know, loneliness was really big in COVID times. And caregiving especially into a newborn child can be incredibly isolating and so it's kind of like the same thing where we need each other we really do and I think that online community when it's done right is really good and I love I'm in it so hell yeah it also to your point I feel almost like a doula to it like I feel like yeah sure we set it up and everything but it really is its own thing takes on a life of its own and it's really surprised us in so many ways and it's teaching us so many things too that's our own specific community but one of the only reasons why I haven't left Facebook is because I still admin some of those global groups I don't want to not be there even Mm -hmm. if you know my presence there isn't as much as it will used to be I think uh, social media, we're going to start seeing some real serious shifting. I'm not sure how, but. One thing that I know for sure, and is that I know nothing. Yeah. Right. Hanging on for dear life. And we'll see. Isn't that the truth? You know, people want to know what you think or whatever. And I want to say, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Who knows? 
Well, Farai, this has been so lovely. Talking to you is honestly just drinking a warm cup of metal tea. Aww, thank you. That's yeah. actually what I'm drinking. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about while you have the, the platform here? You know, you're welcome to just let it loose. People can find me on Instagram at the Hillbilly African. My website is farihherald.com where you can see some of my writing. And I have my Patreon called Folk Herbalism for Everyone. If you're so inclined to learn along with me, learn from me. But yeah, that's really all that I've got going on right now is just trying to maintain those things and survive in the pandemic. Oh, I'm curious about Hillbilly African. I don't think of Kansas as being Hillbilly. So my family is South Kansas and oh. very much country. The town that my family's from is like a population of 200 people. Part of my family is originally from Arkansas. And so mm. my family is very down yonder by the creek hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> and do you feel connected to them, even though you had this different yeah, upbringing? Intensely. I very, very much feel. I don't know because my dad was like that. My dad had a very thick, quote unquote, country accent. And so the more I deepen my understanding and my history, I'm proud of them and I'm proud of all they've ever overcome. And I'm proud to be descended from them, even though there's definite things that I wish, I wish maybe they had stayed in Europe and not come to the Americas. <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that. No, yeah, I definitely feel the two sides of my lineage. I think it's magical. And that's why it's in my name. It has definitely offended some people, but I'm like, oh, whatever. People are going to always find stuff to be offended about. I love it because so much of your story is right there in the name. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. We'll let you go. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Farai. I got so much out of that, and I'm sure the rest of you all did too. Yeah, Cultivating plant allies is a huge part of slow living and the good dirt. And speaking of slow living, we would be remiss not to mention our slow living challenge coming up. It's starting on Sunday. So if you're still here with us and you're listening to this and you haven't signed up for the slow living challenge yet, make sure you do that. It is hosted in the Almanac, which is our paid platform, but we've carved out a section of that platform for this free challenge. So not only do you get to be a part of the four-week slow living challenge with a community of good dirt listeners like yourselves and other lady farmers, but you also get a little taste of what it's like to be on the Almanac membership platform. So that is an awesome opportunity, and we're so excited to get started on this Sunday. So if you're listening to this on the day that it comes out, February 19th yeah then yes this living challenge starts on sunday the 21st and if you're here listening to this later and you still want to join us that's okay too we are keeping all of the challenge information archived in one place so if you're finding this halfway through or when it's almost over no worries you can still sign up and we'll see you in there yeah this is our third annual slow living challenge and it just gets better and better every year especially this year, 2021, when we have a chance to reflect on everything that happened during 2020 and what we want to bring forward into our lives from this challenging time. So it's all really good stuff, y'all. And we enjoy meeting all of you and really hope to see you in there. Let's do it. And if we're not seeing you in there, we'll see you next week on The Good Dirt. Have a great weekend, guys. Bye. Bye.